Welcome to a lecture on a slender slab building. We did a previous video having to do with sizing bearing walls under gravity loads. Now we're going to talk about sizing columns to resist an overturning moment of wind. As a reminder, we're defining a tall slender slab building as one that is shallow enough that units can extend from one broad facade of the building to the other broad facade on the opposite side of the building with no interruption by interior columns. This allows daylight to be harvested for that unit from both facades. And that means the unit can be twice as deep from a daylighting point of view, at least, as a single loaded corridor unit which is only illuminated from one side. It provides view through both of the two large facades on opposite sides of the unit, which essentially accommodates 360 degree views, which may require, of course, you're walking from one side of the unit to the other uh, in order to get the full 360 degree view. view. Such a unit provides excellent opportunities for cross ventilation, for fresh air and ventilation, and it's thermally very efficient with no heat loss or gain through the floor, ceiling, or side walls. The assumptions that we've made so far is that the building depth from one of these major facades to the other is 40 feet. The spacing of the bearing walls is 30 feet. The wall height is 10 feet. The wall thickness is a minimum of 8 inches. The floor thickness is 8 inches. And the density of the concrete from which it is made is 150 pounds per cubic foot, which accounts for some steel reinforcing and uh, dense aggregate. So this is the floor plan. We previously began with this assumption of these eight inch bearing walls. Uh, and we asked ourselves how tall the building could go with various grades of concrete. We did uh, initially ignore the buckling effect, but we said we want that uh, bearing wall to be at least eight inches so that the buckling limitation is not severe and also for fire purposes. And we discovered if we momentarily set aside the issue of buckling that with 10,000 PSI concrete, we could safely go above 90 floors or in other words, roughly 900 feet without crushing of the concrete in those bearing walls. Now, the next thing we want to do is we want to look at wind load and clearly the bearing walls are not ideal for resisting wind load because we're going to see very high stresses and forces either at this end or that end, depending upon the direction of the wind load. So if the wind load is going in the northerly direction, we're going to have a tendency for uplift here and a tendency of, for crushing there. And initially we're just going to check the columns on the leeward side uh, relative to crushing of the material. And we're going to ask how big do those columns have to be? So here we've repeated all those initial assumptions about the building depth, spacing of the bearing walls, and so forth, and we're adding the wind load uh, consideration. So for the moment, we're saying the windward overpressure is 20 pounds per square foot. The leeward suction is 10 pounds per square foot. These uh, numbers have been increased appropriately for a tall building but we have not done this for any specific site. The spreadsheet though that we're going to set up can have these numbers adjusted. So right now we're going to just create the spreadsheet and we're going to base it on these fairly reasonable numbers. So um, in terms of the overall building frame, we don't have to treat these two things separately. Uh, they will act collectively to turn the building over. And when we factor them, we get 48 pounds per square foot. This is 30 pounds a square foot net, and 1.6 times that 
brings us to 48 pounds a square foot. And then when we ask ourselves, what is the total force on a single floor on a single bearing wall edge? Or in other words, we're asking ourselves how much force is going into that resisting wall or the combination of the resisting wall and the columns. So to get this force, we're going to multiply that number times the spacing between the bearing walls times the height of a single floor. So in other words, it's going to be this number right here times 30 feet times 10 feet, which comes out to 14,400 pounds. So we're going to go look at that in our active spreadsheet. Here's our active spreadsheet. And you'll see we've put in 20 and 10, so I should actually make those bold and blue to indicate that they are active cells that we can go modify as inputs. This is calculated, and it's 1.6 times the sum of those two, where 1.6 is the load factor for wind. And when we multiply all that, we get 14,000. 400 pounds, which represents the wind force on essentially one of these units in this tall building. Now we're going to come down and do some calculations here, and I'm going to just scroll up to right there. And I'm going to say if our building was only one story, or if we're just accounting for the bottom floor of our building, and we want to know what is the overturning moment on the bottom floor, it's going to be this 14,500 times 5 feet. So let's go see how we determine that. Here we have the drawing of our building. Uh, the floor-to-floor -floor dimension is 10 feet, and each of these slabs represents the spanning floor between the bearing walls. So back in the back here, in our view is this blank concrete bearing wall, which up till now we're saying serves the purpose of, of uh, fire separation between the units and also uh, is the bearing wall for resisting the gravity loads. Now, we know that we're going to have some columns and we're going to have some bearing walls and they're going to share the gravity load but initially, we're just trying to get a sense of the scope of things or the magnitude of things. So we just started off by saying, let's ask ourselves what this bearing wall can do all by itself. And now when we come to wind loads, we said, well, we know the bearing wall is not the ideal shape. So let's add some columns. And what we're doing is in essence increasing the thickness of the bearing wall at the ends of the bearing wall. So right here we have the outer edge of the column and the inner edge of the column and it's integrated in with the slab. So in effect the column and the slab represent a, a effectively an I section for resisting these overturning forces. Right at the moment though we're just going to ignore the effect of the bearing wall and say it's consumed for gra gravity let's put in these columns for overturning moment so if we take this 14,400 pounds it's centered halfway up that wall and its lever arm in this case is half the height of the floor of a story or in other words five feet the next 14,400 pound is 15 feet up so 15 feet is its lever arm in terms of creating the overturning moment of wind. We have another one at 25 feet, which is centered on the third floor. So we would have to add all of these up, and we're going to do that in our spreadsheet. A couple of points I want to make. You see down at the base, there is a shear force at the bottom surface of the bottom shear wall. That has to be there because there is a very substantial wind load on this building. And if there was no shear force at the base, it would be like the building was built on ice and the building would just begin to accelerate horizontally. 
because there'd be nothing to keep it anchored where it is. We know the building is not on ice. It's not on a smooth bearing. It can't move uh, indefinitely uh, under these forces and be a satisfactory solution. So we have to have this shear force. Now all of these distributed forces of wind up here in combination with this shear force below, um, there's, there's a net effect of all these forces. There's a center of action which is elevated about halfway up the building. And that force in conjunction with this shear force at the base is creating the overturning moment associated with wind. And we've basically said right now we're going to size these columns to create the force couple for the internal resisting moment that's going to keep the building from toppling over. So these big blue forces are the forces at the base of the building associated with creating this internal resisting moment that keeps the building from toppling over. So we got 14,400 times 5 feet plus 14,400 times 15 feet plus 14,400 times 25. So in our calculations, we'd say if we have only one story, the overturning moment of the wind will be 14,000 pounds, 14,400 pounds times the lever arm of five feet, which is 72,000 pound feet. If we have two stories, we have two of these overturning moments, one of which is the 14,400 pounds times five feet, so that's the overturning moment associated with the wind on the bottom floor. And then we have the overturning moment associated with the wind on the second floor. Again, it's 14,400 pounds and its lever arm is 15 feet. So the overturning moment associated with the first floor is, is 72,000 pound feet. And the overturning moment associated with wind on the second floor is 216,000 pound feet, and the two of those add up to 288,000 pound feet. Now we'll make the point that typically wind gets stronger as we go up the building, and we have a formula for dealing with that, but for the moment we're keeping this simple. We've assumed the same 20 pounds a square foot of overpressure on the windward side, and 10 pounds a square foot of suction on the leeward side and we're assuming that's the same all the way up. It's going to be substantially less than that at the lower floors. It might be a bit more than that at the upper floors, uh, but for the moment we're going to take uh, that as a fairly conservative number. So if we have three stories, we have 14,400 times 5 feet on the first floor, 14,400 pounds times 15 feet for the second floor, 14,400 pounds times 25 feet for the third floor, and then we sum all of those together and we get 648,000 pound feet. Now we would keep going uh, in this, so we're going to do that, and we're going to generate the spreadsheet that looks like this. I'm going to flip back to our active spreadsheet and I'm going to say what is this formula? It is dollar sign F19. So that's this cell right here. And by the way, I put dollar sign F dollar sign 19 because I only have this number in one cell and when I fill this formula down, I don't want that. To, I want it to always go back to that cell. I don't want it to update it. Now the second part of this is I have E25, which is the number of floors, times B10. And B10, by the way, was the height of one floor, which in this case is 10 feet. But we put that in as an active cell. So somewhere up here we did B10, which is the height of the wall. We've put it in as 10 feet, but we want it to be a general formula. In other words, we don't want to always deal only with 10 feet. We want someone to be able to come back to this template 
and in the cell that represents wall height, if their wall height or their floor height is 9.5 feet, we want them to be able to put it in there. If it's 16 feet, we want them to be able to put it in there. So in this formula, we've multiplied times that, but then we've also uh, subtracted off half of that. So half of the wall height. So this number right here, we have the number of floors times 10 feet in this case, minus 10 feet over two, which is five feet. And this is how we're getting the five feet of net lever arm. When we come down here and we ask, what's the overturning moment associated with the wind on the second floor? Again, it is F19, which is this number right here, times E26, which is the number of stories, times the height of a story, minus half the height of the story again. And when we come here, You'll notice, by the way, nothing changes as we go from formula to formula, except this cell right here. So watch this. I'm clicking there. I have E25, E26, E27, but this number doesn't change. The B10 doesn't change because those are absolute cell references. Now, Right here I said this is the sum, well I just said it's equal to whatever's there, but it's intended to be whatever is the cumulative overturning moment of wind on all the stories. So if we only have one story, this number right here has to equal that number right there. Now this number is a little different because it says G25, which is this number, that's from the previous cumulative plus whatever's happening on the second floor, which is F26. When I go here, it says F27, which is this, plus G26, which was the previous cumulative value. So when I get to this formula, it's like I want to add that and that, or if I get here, I want to add all three of those. But what I'm doing instead is I'm keeping in this column the cumulative, the running cumulative value. So this will be that plus that, and this will be that plus that. And that's just a simple way of getting this to work in Excel. Now I could write a formula where this right here would be the sum of all four of those but it's easier to simply say it's this floor plus the pre previous cumulative value. So we do all of that and um, we then have an internal resisting moment force. And if we come back here for a moment, um, this force right here is the one we're trying to get at. You will recall, well actually you may not know this yet, but the moment of these two forces can be achieved or found by taking the moment about a point here, in which case that force has no lever arm, and this force has the full lever arm of the space between them. So in this case that's 40 feet, so 40 feet times the magnitude of this force is going to equal the resisting moment or in other words this force is going to be the cumulative moment of all of these forces divided by 40 feet. So I'm going to go back to the spreadsheet and take a look at that and I'm going to say now this internal re resisting moment is going to equal the cumulative moment, which is G25, divided by B8. And in case you don't remember, B8 is this 40 feet. That's the lever arm for the internal resisting moment. And by the way, I want it to always go back to that cell because I always want it to be the spacing between the two columns that are creating the internal resisting moment. 
So I put dollar sign B, dollar sign 8, meaning it's always supposed to go back to that cell and we're not supposed to update it. So I then took all of this and said control down, meaning fill in the formulas. And all it did was it updated whatever didn't have an absolute reference, which turns out to be whatever is in this. So this is going to equal that number right there divided by this 40 foot lever arm that the two columns have. So this form, this force is in pounds. This 1800 is 7,200 foot pounds or pound feet divided by 40 feet. And that all these numbers are just achieved by dragging down and hitting control D, which means control the formula down or fill it down um, to uh, perform those calculations for us. So then I came along and I said, well, what if we had F sub C for a column of 10,000? Now, what I've been doing, actually, I could have put that presumption somewhere up here and probably should have, but I wrote it down here and rather than put an absolute reference in, I just filled it down because we could, in fact, go and change that value um, if we wanted to. But for the moment, I just filled this 10,000 down everywhere. And then I come along and I say the required column area to create that magnitude of force, 1,800 pounds, and not exceed the stress here is going to equal this value, which is the force, divided by that stress. So it's H25 divided by I25, but you'll notice that 10,000 pounds per square inch has been multiplied by this 0.65, which is our resistance factor for concrete. It is an indicator of how much confidence we have or confidence we don't have. So we're reducing the stress that we're going to tolerate in that material by 35%. In other words, we're going to keep it down at 65% or less of the crushing stress, which is 10,000 pounds per square inch. If this 0.65 had not been there in the denominator, then this number would have been smaller but we've increased the area. Now, you'll notice this area is incredibly small. It's 0.28 square inches. So that's like about a half an inch by a half an inch. This is a really minimal force that this concrete is able to withstand. As we go up though, the required area increases. And here we have the dimension of a square column which would produce about that area. So I mentioned 0.5. Um, this is 1.11 uh, square inch, which would require about 1.1 inch on each side of the square column. These, of course, are like a joke. These are minimal requirements. But now if we scroll down, we discover that before we set our bearing wall, assuming we ignore uh, buckling of the wall, could carry us, this eight inch bearing wall, could carry us up to 92 stories. If we went there and we sized these columns for the wind load all the way up that 92 story building, we're gonna need a column that's about four feet by four feet. This is 48 inches by 48 inches. Now, this is a very slender building. And in fact, this is a 920 foot tall building and it's only 40 feet deep. So it's uh, a slenderness ratio that's around 25 or 26, I think. It's absurdly high by any of the standards we've accepted. But we're basically saying if we have the eight inch thick bearing wall and we have 
uh, this 48 inch school by 48 inch column on each side we have adequate strength in this building to resist gravity loads and resist wind loads now what we have not accounted for the, in this is deflection and in a tall slender building like this deflection is going to govern the design so we have a strong enough building but we don't have a stiff enough building and it may move in a fairly radical way under wind load but if we can find ways to suppress that wind load then this building would be okay it would have adequate strength um, to hold up under all the gravity loads and the wind loads. It's also important to point out that in a seismic environment like San Francisco, for example, such a massive and slender building would probably be governed by seismic forces rather than wind forces. So we will need to look at deflection and we'll need to look at seismic forces also in order to assess this further. This four foot by four foot column, by the way, um, has reduced the amount of wall that we can glaze on the major facades down to 26 feet. So we're not 30 feet the full width of a unit or even 30 minus eight inches. We're 30 minus four feet. Nonetheless, a panoramic window that's 26 feet wide uh, can be a very pleasing window, particularly when you realize that you will never be more than 20 feet away from such a window. Such a, an apartment would be considered a really extraordinary um, place to live, I think, in terms of view, daylight, and cross-ventilation. Again, though, we have to look next at this issue of deflection, um, which is going to be crucial in the design of this building. Another uh, crucial thing that we want to look at before we're done is we've ascertained how big these columns need to be in order to avoid crushing of the column. We'd also like to know whether the gravity loads, so before we talked about all the gravity loads involved in these slabs and in the bearing walls, we'd like to know how effective that dead weight is in resisting an overturning moment associated with wind. So we can't move on to seismic yet until we have some notion of whether wind is going to cause this building to topple over because we can't generate the tensile force at the base. Of course, part of thinking about that tensile force is to remember that we're going to have um, a raft footing, which will probably be eight inches thick of concrete that extends substantially beyond the base of this building. We'll also have piles which go maybe 100 feet down let's say uh, 70 to 150 feet down. And those will be friction piles. They will have a certain amount of mass associated with them, but they will also um, provide a hold down force associated with the soil, which has a friction connection to those piles. So a lot of really interesting questions still to be answered. Um, and we're going to take those one by one. So that ends our lecture on sizing columns to resist overturning moment of wind in a slender slab building.